uh, we actually missed four classes. Yes, uh, one one of the classes in the last two. I mean, last week we did a class one night. Last two days we did a class two one night. Well, excuses are not supposed to be happening. So it didn't happen anyway. I'm a bit sorry on a crab chill. I had to go to the doctor. We had some appointment <coughs> and try to pull the dog out. So uh, let's jump into the heat transfer process and then uh, we'll take it from there. <coughs> Heat transfer process chapter tate should be the general genie should say J core thin ideas. So if I write heat transfer process, there are basic three processes conduction, convection, radiation. You just need to understand. We just need to understand the very key mechanism by which each of these processes work. There is some atomic level or molecular level explanation for how these processes work. And we need to understand that part. If you understand how these three different ways of heat transfer work, then you can use these three parts to explain a lot of different scenarios. In your exam, you will be asked mostly about those real life examples. For example, uh, let's say uh, one of the examples can be something like this. So we have a rod that is made up of two different material. Let's say half of the rod is made of wood and half of the rod is made up of copper. They are joined together and we have we are we have wrapped around this thing with a piece of paper like this so it's a cylindrical paper that is wrapped around this joint now if we apply a small bit of flame somewhere below not exactly not to catch fire so we just apply a bit of flame a bit of heat over here with a bit of distance what should we see and why should we see that that can be explained by some part of this knowledge. Then also, uh, how, uh, what should be a proper placement for an air conditioner in a room? If we are trying to cool down the temperature of, of a room, if what is, should be the proper placement of a heater of a room and, and how these things should be arranged. These are the type of things that we have to understand and be able to explain using the concepts that we're gonna learn from these three processes. Then how does the greenhouse effect work? Why is it important? And how can we, how, how, how can we uh, achieve its advantage for our purposes, our requirements, and how, why it is bad for the environment or the atmosphere or the global warming thing, those stuffs. To be honest, the number of examples that can be made using these three concepts of heat transfer processes are numerous. You can have a lot of different examples, a lot of different scenarios that you will require to, you can actually explain. So there is practically no bounds that what kind of practical scenario the examiners, gonna, examiners are gonna set, set the examples from. <clears throat> That's why we are going to look at a quite a good number of examples, which is within our textbook format and also within our uh, uh, within our question papers uh, format. So we're gonna see come across a lot of examples, but what you need to understand that these are not the end of the examples. There can be a lot of other examples involved for the heat transfer processes. As long as you understand the underlying principle properly, it shouldn't be a big deal for you. If in any case, if it is difficult for you to understand, well, I'm always here, I'll try to help you understand. So that's the key part. So ultimate aim to say, real life scenario explain the heat transfer and blah blah blah. Let me jump into that individual discussion of these three parts. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit so that I have a bit more writing space. Conduction primarily means the heat transfer that happens from and two solids
I should use all three of these prepositions. It also means it involves vibration of fixed particles. <clears throat> Faster vibration, gives faster conduction. Convection. It is the heat transfer process within fluid. <clears throat> it involves density variation. <clears throat> lighter fluid that is usually warmer as well rises up and vice versa third point i would say mm, particles translate Translation means actual movement, move from one place to another. Assalamu alaikum, sir. What's up? Wa alaikum assalam. Uh, not much. I am back. That's up. So you're teaching us physics, right? Yes. Looks like you're a good teacher. But your handwriting is really ugly, no offense. Damn, it is so ugly. Zawad al Wasi, it okay. How am I going to read it? It's so ugly. Munit's a kitty one ticket case in Lake Sato Bichi. Ew, man. I'm sorry for the interruption. I don't, I'm not sure what happened there, but it was a definitive disturbance. So I kicked them out, whatever. For those of you who have handwriting, I am not sure if any of you are having difficulties with my handwriting because I'm writing and reading at the same time. Please ask me to reread them. My handwritings are bad. I know this for a fact. That's why I prefer to give printed materials and I'm not proud of this, but this is something that I do not want to deal with at my age. Radiation. <clears throat> Radiation is the type of heat transfer process that happens uh, when uh, in the electromagnetic form, electromagnetic radiation form, electromagnetic. Electromagnetic is a, a word that can be written in short form. Both of the uh, letters of the acronym are capital, capital E, capital M, electromagnetic radiation. And now we do not, we haven't yet read about the electromagnetic spectrum part, which is a significant portion of our uh, waves chapter within which eventually uh, we'll see that the entire electromagnetic spectrum, the variation of the electromagnetic waves, they are classified depending upon their frequency and wavelength variations. And based upon that, we can have the entire spectrum divided into, divided into uh, six, uh, seven different parts. That's how the scientists have named them. There is no hard and fast rule that why we call them different that way. Scientists just decided that, okay, fine, we're going to call this part this and this part this and this part that and so on and so forth. So one of those part is the is called infrared radiation. Uh, heat waves from hot object, which radiates, is radiated from a warm object, always come in infrared radiations, which is also has a short form of IR. So I'm going to write only IR over here. Uh, it is the fastest process of heat transfer, uh, fastest process. 
in vacuum, uh, in vacuum, the speed is the same as the speed of light, 210 meters per second. And this does not involve, does not involve any particle movement whatsoever. whatsoever <coughs> disregard that and another property of the radiation is that <coughs> can selectively i'm going to explain what this means can selectively pass slash penetrate through material <laughs> I mean, eventually, a point gula to one of the notes of but there is a possibility I might actually forget those. So, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take a screenshot of this one and send this image to your uh, place, <clears throat> bam, so that we can take reference from here later on. I'm going to put the cost of it, but if you can, uh, oops, I was supposed to send it here. Uh, yes. <clears throat> All right. So, if you try, if if you if you don't understand these parts, I mean, let me give you some examples. So, I mean, could common at example the student they get conversion radiation boost. I should say, let's say, we have a cooking pot. माइक्रोफोन कनेक्शन this, uh, so don't be uh, don't feel weird if that some noise happens this is something that i cannot control what i can do i can put my phone in airplane mode that would be a better idea to do but i don't want to do that for reasons unknown whatever let's have a look at this example let's say we have a cooking pot let me show you that cooking pot with ash color maybe so let's say Shana, this is not a good idea let's say this is a cooking pot so let's say we have a saucepan and within this saucepan, we have some water up to filled up up to this level. So this is all water. <coughs> uh, did I tell you the uh, uh, structure of solid, liquid, and gas? Did I discuss about this part to with you kids? That how does the uh, part, how the particles of solid, liquids, and gases are uh, uh, bond bonded within uh, within themselves? I think I did. Yes, sir, you did. Okay. Uh, you need to remember this part that in solid the particles are uh, we are we usually use the term particle because it in generally means uh, atoms or molecules wherever it is applicable so if you are talking about a pure metal pure element then the particle would mean atom of that solid piece of metal uh, if it is a uh, if it is a if it is a compound then a particle would mean a molecule of that uh, of that compound so we use the term particle to in generally mean both atoms and molecules whenever that is it is applicable the way it is applicable so let's say this is a so let's say this is a certain uh, metallic pot that we have and we have water filled up over here and we are going to start uh, we're going to place a flame over here the, uh, with a bunsen burner or a regular regular stuff so we are, we are playing uh, applying some heat over here now intentionally i am using i'm placing uh, the heat at the center of the cooking pot i, I did not spread it over all the way uh, i have some intention over here how does the heat transfer happens 
well, I mean, what is actually happening over here? I'm going to be covering all these three, three stuff over here. Try to understand. The way a flame works, listen to me very carefully. How does any flame comes into existence? What is a flame? I mean, what is the difference between a basic gaseous substance and a flame? Is flame not a gaseous substance? The answer is yes. Flame is also a gaseous substance. But it is a transforming gaseous substance. A flame is essentially the mixture of at least two types of gaseous material, at least two types of gaseous material, where they are undergoing some chemical reaction in gaseous state. For example, uh, methane, whenever it is, if you, if, you, if you just turn up the gas of our basic stoves, in Bangladesh, our uh, natural gas is mostly methane. I mean, more than 90% is methane. So let's say you are gonna get methane gas coming up, but unless you actually light it up, you're gonna only have methane gas with it. It's not actually producing a flame, it's only methane gas. And as it is coming out of the stove, we should not do that. I'm just saying, saying you for example, uh, as, the, uh, as the methane gas comes out, it, it, it automatically mixes up with the atmosphere. Atmosphere is nearly 68% nitrogen, about 31% oxygen, and the 1% is the other stuff, carbon dioxide and everything. Something like that. So nitrogen is mostly inert. It does not actually undergo any chemical reaction for at regular temperature, mostly inert. Uh, and But oxygen is not inert. So methane gas mixes with the oxygen. But if we do not start the flame, it's just going to give be in mix, mixture format and it's going to slowly uh, diffuse outwards by means of Brownian motion. You guys know what Brownian motion is. Do you see the Brownian motion persona? Yes, so sir. Brownian motion. It is the random haphazard movement of fluid particles <laughs> in all directions. Random and haphazard. Both of them are equally uh, equally important. That you cannot predict this part of the movement of this particle. I mean, this is basically how diffusion works. So, so if we do not light up the gas, then we're going to only have a mixture of methane plus the atmosphere. However, whenever we put up a flame or we give it a bit of a spark with some lighter lightning uh, lighter mechanism, then this methane gas, gas state plus oxygen gas state, these two are going to start to react. The moment they start to react, they are going to convert into CO2 plus H2O. You can see that all of these four matter four 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 stuffs the reactants and also the products, they are all in gas state. The region of space within which this conversion happening, the region of space within which this chemical conversion or chemical decomposition and recomposition is happening, that part is seen to be flame. That is the part where we can see the light coming up. So if you see this is the flame, you have to understand, uh, if, you, if you see that this is the part is the flame, you have to understand that uh, Around the flame, right over here, we have atmosphere plus carbon dioxide and, and, and vapor. <clears throat> As the flame comes out of the Bunsen burner, if there is a bit of a gap between the uh, tip of the Bunsen burner and the flame getting started, sometimes it can happen if the flame, for, if the methane pressure is too high. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, fire is gonna have a bit of a hard time to catch up with the in incoming flame that can happen. If it's more applicable for blow torches as well. So in those places, we have only the methane gas. And then within this within this flame, the part that appears to be flame, blue or red or orange, whatever the color is, this is the part where the chemical reaction keeps on happening. That's the flame. Within this chemical process, the molecules get a huge amount of energy. This is an exothermic reaction, which means these molecules, after the reaction, they will become extremely excited and they'll have a significantly higher kinetic energy. They're gonna be bumping around at a very high speed. At the same time, in the process of this chemical decomposition and recomposition, some photons or light waves will be created because electrons will be, I mean, whenever the chemical decomposition happens, we have a lot of electron transfer from one shell to another shell. And whenever electrons jumps from one, one shell to another shell, they always tend to give out some sort of electromagnetic radiation. So in case of methane gas, that electromagnetic radiation happens to fall within the visible spectrum and it happens to be blue. If you use some other type of gases, for example, if you use propane gas, which is the gas from the lighter, at a lower temperature, it, it burns, uh, at high temperature, it burns blue, and then at a lower temperature, it burns yellow. The gas lighter, if you, if you turn, turn up a gas lighter, you'll see that the lower part is slightly blue, bluish, and then the top part is yellow, because as that flame goes higher, it loses heat energy, and in the, in the lower temperature, it becomes a bit uh, yellowish and orange color, and then the flame, flame sim simply goes out so different elements can have different characteristic color that's a that's a different issue that's a chemistry issue but what i'm trying to tell you is that in that process of chemical reaction energy will be released and some energy will be uh, will be uh, will be occupied some energy will be 
will be going to these molecules, these produce molecules over here. They will have some huge amount of kinetic energy, individually huge amount of kinetic energy. They, essentially, no, not all of them will have the same kinetic energy. They, some of them will have more, some of them will have less, which is obvious because it's a uh, statistical probability that who, which particle is going to get how much kinetic energy, but they're going to get a pretty much a good amount of kinetic energy. And additional to this, we're going to have some <coughs> EM wave. I'm going to write EM wave coming out. So I'm writing EM over here because the flame, let's say methane gas flame, it produces a blue color, blue color that we can see. Additional to this blue color, if someone, if so, let's say this is a this is a methane gas uh, flame. We are seeing a blue color over here. So this is the blue color that we are seeing. So that is uh, we our retina uh, is uh, sensitive to this color. Additional to this, if we place our hand somewhere over here, <coughs> if we place our hand over here, we can actually feel the heat as well, which means not only this flame is emitting visible light. It is also emitting the heat radiation, which is which we, which I described, described a bit earlier as infrared radiation. Which means now this flame is also radiating out towards my hand some infrared radiation as well. Which means the two the, the, this flame is actually producing two type of radiations. One is infrared radiation, and is also producing some visible light. This infrared radiation happens to be the heat ray or the heat heat wave and the visible light is the visible light by which we actually are, uh, see this, this flame there are certain elements which can uh, there are certain compounds which burn with with invisible flames these are extremely dangerous type of fuel uh, but they can have from pretty, pretty really good uh, burning capabilities they are mostly used in very high performance uh, formula one uh, or moto gp uh, performance tests uh, but they can they can be very very hazardous because if someone catches uh, the flame of these things uh, no one can see that they are burning, but they are actually burning because there no, the reason no one can see because the person is not going to produce any visible flame, but their clothes might, very, uh, might as very well be on flame, but it's not visible. So the person is burning, but no one is seeing it. So just from the reaction of this person, someone has to understand, experienced people have to understand that this person is in flame and they have to put it out in some appropriate process. So that can be a pretty difficult thing to do and, de and dangerous thing to deal with. But everywhere we have danger plus uh, success together side by side and also precautions are all, also always needed point that i'm trying to make this electromagnetic radiation comes in two formats we can have visible light and we can also have infrared radiation a part two portion to i did not yet enter into the uh, cooking pot part i just talked about the flame and the release of the infrared radiation i also talked about that these two these produce molecules will also have some significant amount of kinetic energy and also i actually forgot to mention one more thing that the Atmosphere is made up with nitrogen. So in, within this mixture, we'll, we're, we're going to have some significant portion of nitrogen as well. This nitrogen is not going to take part into uh, chemical reaction. But whenever the carbon dioxide and H2 will be produced, they are going to essentially collide into some of the nitrogen molecules which are surrounding uh, those, those particles as well, because it's a very important and large portion of the atmosphere. So those nitrogen molecules are also going to get some significant amount of kinetic energy, which means basically means that all the gases molecules that are within this flame part, they are all going to be highly energetic and have a huge amount of kinetic energy. Any questions so far? Anyone? But I can EF Turkey. EM is the short form force. Electromagnetic waves. Electromagnetic waves. IR infrared Egula short form like nothing. Hey, Egula short form acronyms. So, when Egula allowed acronyms, so that's a good thing. Our Hotse Egula full details about individual usage and Egula QA producer Shigulamra among the wave segment of Porbojita Hotsama Thamalari Pora segment. So, Kup Shig regular details as be. I mean, a short form Gula the Porazik and eventually Tomaja Kampura Silva Sheshkore Filba. The whole syllabus will be within your grasp. So, in that case, this will be more easier for you to deal like this. Okay, anyone else? Any, any question? No. Okay. One thing we need to understand that the infrared radiation of the visible light, this is actually radiated from a hot object or from a warm object, this electromagnetic radiation, this actually gives, it, it spreads out in all directions, like a spherical direction spherical direction not essentially like a circular spherical direction so if you have a hot object over here and if it is radiating it's going to radiate heat energy in all directions but additional to this it's going to produce some significantly high energy output above the heat source there's a reason for this try to understand if we have a hot object over here, let's say this is a this is an object that is hot uh we can consider this is a hot piece of metal 
so let's say we have uh, we have heated up some metal piece and we have placed it over here in the atmosphere. So this metal piece is essentially radiating heat all directions. So if you place up your hand pretty, uh, slightly close to the object, you can actually feel the warm of the object. So, and that radiation, in fact, radiation is happening every in all directions uniformly, above, below, down, left, top, front, front, back, everywhere. However, this hot object is essentially surrounded by atmosphere. So what essentially happens, whenever any atmospheric particles get close to this thing, they take a certain significant portion of the thermal energy of the from this block and they start to move faster faster movement pushes out the neighboring particles a bit further away as a result whenever any molecule actually takes energy from this hot object they actually make the intermolecular spacing of the neighboring particles much bigger let's say the atmosphere was far more dense on the outside let's say the atmosphere is really dense but close to the, the hot object the atmosphere is going to become less dense because the moment the atmospheric particle receive energy from the hot object they start to move faster so they hit the neighboring particles at a much higher force and their separation gets increased and separation getting increased means now they have a lower density and we do know from our uh, density pressure chapter that lighter objects always tend to float and heavier objects or more dense object tends to tends to sink so what happens this lighter less dense fluid or the lighter air is going to start to rise upwards to start to rise upwards. So whenever the atmosphere is leaving from this region, we're going to produce a bit of a partial vacuum over here, not full vacuum, partial vacuum is molecules are leaving. So what's going to happen to that left alone space? Is it going to remain empty? No, obviously no, because we have a lot of atmospheric particles over here. To fill up that void, <laughs> to fill up that partial void, cold atmospheric particles are going to run into this, into, in, into this thing. So cold air is going to run into this thing from the sides like that and hot atmospheric molecules are going to rise up like this we call this the hot current usually represented by red in many of your books and the air that is incoming is usually represented as it is called the cold current so the cold current is the room temperature or the regular air molecules which are rushing in to fill up the partial void and hot 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 current is the uh, group of air molecules which have received the heat energy and they are starting to go upwards this can tell you one essential thing that what try to understand because and this process of this uh, heat transfer process is what you call the convection. If you have a look at the key points for the convection process, what you'll see, it says that convection uh, uh, in, uh, uh, convection includes heat transfer process within fluid bodies. So we are now talking about. So in my example, I was talking about the fluid tra heat transfer within air involves density variation. So there will be some sort of density variation. Lighter fluid rises and vice versa. I don't vice versa just to mean that denser fluid or cooler or 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 cooler fluid uh, falls downwards. And number three is that particle translate. Translate means actual movement from point A to point B, from one location to one another location. In conduction process, the particles never actually leave their equilibrium position. In solid, the particles are stuck in their position. They can vibrate faster or they can vibrate slowly. If the temperature is high, they're going to vibrate faster, but they're still going to be pretty much stuck within that position. If the object becomes cooler, the particles are going to move, vibrate less vigorously if the particle is warm the particles are going to vibrate more vigorously but they are pretty much stuck in their position that's not the case for convection in convection uh, which happens in fluid fluid essentially means liquid or solid uh, sorry liquid or gas uh, so within fluid bodies the convection car when convection happens particles will actually move from one point to another point and then it's a uh, so these are the three points that is the part of this uh, fluid body so this actually tells us that it is a good idea to put the flame source underneath the cooking pot because whenever we're going to put the put the heat okay, flames uh, heat source underneath the cooking pot the this surface of the cooking pot is going to receive a huge amount of heat because of the convection current if we did place the flame right over here we are going to receive the radiation heat from the source as well but that radiation heat might not as well be strong enough or fierce enough to actually make some significant heat in case, and most of the heat energy would be actually going into the atmosphere and become wasted. That's why we always, whenever we are cooking, we always play, put our cooking pots above the flame, not on the side. If you wonder, well, sometimes we can also put stuff on the side and we can have a uh, have, have stuff cooked. Yeah, that's true. Uh, for example, if you are trying to cook something using a bonfire, a bonfire is basically means that you have a lot, you have a chunk of wood that you have gathered around and you have set it into flame and it makes a huge amount of temperature that so that the temperature is so hot that if you place some uh, tilted uh, food uh, uh, nearby, that can be pretty much be cooked from the radiation heat. 
this is possible because the heat source itself is very very fierce it is very 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 hot and it that warmth can be felt from a pretty far away distance as well but that's not the regular case i mean if you want to efficiently cook something efficiently heat up something it is always the best choice to put the cooking object cookable object atop the flame okay <clears throat> the next thing that i'm going to discuss and then then we're going to take a break for the uh, maghrib prayer is that i'm going to show you a bit of a highly magnified view a bit of a highly magnified view of this part so let's say this is the bottom of the cooking pot i'm showing you this metal as this much thing so this this said this is the whole metal part here we have water molecules say i'm showing you the water molecules using blue dots and they are clustered i'm not going to fill it up but try to understand that these are the water molecules and under the water molecules let's say we have the uh burnt gas these are the gas molecules so try to understand what is happening these particles are going to go up because of convection and they're going to collide with these metal particles over here the moment they collide with the metal particles over here the metal particles receive a portion of their kinetic energy not necessarily all of them a portion a segment of this kinetic energy and after receiving this kinetic energy this metal particle is going to start to vibrate more vigorously this vibration is going to disturb the neighboring particles now this is the part that you need to understand because within this part we have the flame for the entire underneath segment have a look i have drawn the circle over here which means this all of this underneath segment is subjected to the flame which means every part of every atom of the lower surface of the cooking pot of the metal cooking pot they are being collided with the high energetic uh, flame so they are all receiving a huge chunk of kinetic energy and as a result they are all highly energetic and disturbed they are definitely going to collide sideways as well but mostly the energy will be transferred above because all of the particles side by side they are all energetic and the only way they can transfer the energy uh, is above if you wonder wouldn't they uh, in a, give us some energy in the downward direction the answer is yes whenever the metal pot becomes hot this will also start to radiate its own energy any hot object will always radiate, radiate energy but the because of the placement of the flame the amount of transferred heat into the metal would be far more large compared to the amount of heat that this metal pot will be giving out in terms of its own radiation which means overall the heat would be actually slowly going up heat will be going up not the particles so the particles are going to vibrate this is going to have never vibrate the next one this is going to have the next one this is going to have the next one so slowly the disturbance will increase and the metal is going to become warmer and eventually this very last material over here let me zoom in a little bit more so eventually this final uh, this most uh, top metal atom will also become disturbed and this is going to start to vibrate as well this vibration will now start to vibrate this vibration will now start to uh, uh, let's say let's not use the term vibrate this vibration will now start to disturb the neighboring water molecules and whenever the water molecules have will be will be receiving the kinetic energy from these metal particles they now have the freedom to actually physically move apart because water molecules are not actually stuck with each other pretty much like the metals or the solid particles so these water molecules are going to start to uh, hit each other pretty vigorously and become less dense so the intermolecular spacing over here would be come more uh, more so the water uh, neighbor neighbor neighboring to this part of the segment will become less dense and they are going to start to go up and to fill up that uh, fill up that moved away space cooler water will be flowing in so what is going to happen within this part try to understand heat will be transferred from here and the part of the cooking pot let's say uh, let me use red the part of the cooking pot which is above the flame this part of the cooking water on this on pretty much you can actually increase this a little bit more but if there is a gradual uh, uh, gradual diminishing behavior over here let's say water within this part will become warm and here we're going to have pretty much vertical uh, pretty much vertical uh, uh, hot current water is going to rise up through this segment and to fill up this space cold current is going to start to slide in from the side like this and this is going to and and you are seeing it from left and right because i'm showing you a side view but this actually happens from all the directions so 
the way we can actually visualize this physical movement, I mean, water molecules are transparent, so there's no way you can see the water molecules. The, but one of the ways we can actually see this uh, movement of the particles is that if we drop some visible visible particles, for example, say you can, you can, you can produce some, what can I say, uh, ada, do you know ginger? Uh, if, you, if you grate some ginger, you're gonna get some very small fine particles. Let's say we put some uh, grated, grated ginger over here. Well, you'll see that they are gonna spread around and you can see that whenever the ginger particles are coming somewhere over a certain region where this is very hot, they're gonna be pushed upward at a very high force and they're gonna spread out to the border. They're gonna go all the way pretty much close to the border and they're gonna slowly sink in through this part. And eventually at the moment they come up over here, they're gonna once again start rising up. So this is how the convection current happens. And this is how the conduction happens. And I also talked about the radiation a bit earlier. So this is the example that I usually uh, take uh, help for to explain all the three parts in detail for multiple uh, stages. Any question? Yeah, the weight of the ginger will matter. That's why I didn't say that, that you should uh, slice the ginger. Uh, you should grate the ginger because whenever you grate the ginger, they're going to be pretty small particles. So they can actually freely move around pretty well. Well, obviously, if we use very large chunk of particles, for example, let's say if I place a ball bearing over here, ball bearing, some. I'm sorry. If you place some ball bearing over here, ball bearings are actually pretty large of it and they're very, really dense. So they are not going to essentially rise up. You need to put objects which are uh, which are somewhat within the region so that they can actually uh, sink and they can also move around and you can actually see the movement of this whole thing. If you don't have ginger, uh, grated ginger, you can also put some uh, uh, pencil, uh, pencil sharpener used, uh, 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 what is it called? Sharpener, J, cut it. Lead, lead. No, not the lead. Lead is the graphite the part. Oh yeah, yes. You can also put in some, uh, some, 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 yeah, some, some chapata, uh, tea, some tea, ground, uh, ground tea, not the leaves, ground tea, uh, anything that you can. I mean, you can put anything, and you can see the whole boiling process happening. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Let's take a break for about ten minutes, and we'll resume class at six twenty-five after Margaret Pierre. Thank you very much. I mean, no, I mean, the class is not over, but we're taking a break. So we started to resume the recording. So this is the very basic idea for how the three processes work. So beyond this point, we're going to see some re, uh, good examples, real time, exa uh, not real time, uh, some real time examples. And uh, the book that I personally recommend to read the heat transfer processes is the AF Abbott book. How many of you have that book? This is a small book with blue cover with a Concord on the cover page. Uh, do, do, you, do you kids have that book? Hold on, don't I guess the AFI butter boy to ask it? Physics, I'm not going to so this is a very good book in my opinion for when, when this chapter is very well written within this book for the heat transfer process you can read a lot of stuff over here and to be honest you are not going to need all the stuff that is discussed within this chapter because this is actually a supplementary book not the textbook but all the information that you have over here would be somewhat required for you for your full understanding and full mark scoring process of the heat transfer process chapter so i highly recommend that you that recommend that so i highly recommend that you read it through Anything that you don't understand or doesn't make sense, you should see this. One of the first things that I would like to see, have a, take your attention is to this, this paragraph. Have a look. If a steel rod is held by one end and the opposite, opposite end is placed in Bunsen flame, it is noticed very soon that the rod becomes warm to the fingers. It travels to the metal by a process called conduction. This process is complex. It differs between metals and non-metals. Hear me out. And only a brief explanation can be attempted here. When a metal is heated, metal is heated, keyword, Free electrons, which it contains, begin to move faster. That is, their kinetic energy increases. These electrons then drift towards the cooler parts of the metal, where their energy is transferred by collision to the metal molecules there. At the same time, there is a drift of slower moving cooler electrons in the reverse direction. So this is talking about some sort of cross flow of electrons. 
So if we put one end of the metal in a in a in a hot object in a hot flame, and we are holding the other end, then hot electrons are going to travel towards the cooler end, and cold electrons are going to travel towards the hot end. And th this is going to happen cross flow. There is not going to be a hot current individually distinguished over hot current or cold current. There is going to be like a jumbled Brownian motion kind of cross flow. Uh, to a much less extent, heat energy is transmitted through a metal by vibrations of the atoms themselves, which pass on energy from one to the other in the form of waves. Now, this is the actual description that I have told you. So within metals, heat will be transferred from hot end to cold end by both vibration of the fixed ions Uh, yeah, Asif, I'm coming to your uh, answer. Yes, it's a good question. Sir, our name is Kedu. Yes, Adinu her name. You are Adinu Han. Sir, I have a direct account of our name. But no one is. And that person just left. It took a disturbed question. I a person to say though. There were now then 12 people. Then I kicked the disturbing person out and then it became 10. Now it suddenly became 11. And the moment that you mentioned this, can I actually trace this person who are coming in and out from the log? Yes, I can. So up me account lock for them money room to lock for them. Room lock for again. Settings at the gate. Lock is it. Uh, yes, sir, locked. Oh, yes. I have locked our room. <laughs> okay, never mind. Achha, Zoom has a lot of a lot of uh, interactivity. I, I actually don't know much. I just know the parts that I need. Achha, whenever metals will be heated, I mean, I, let me just start to tell you uh, first about non-metals. If you have a non-metal where there is no free electrons, the only way heat can transfer is by conduction. Conduction in this case exclusively mean by means of vibration, transferring the kinetic energy from one molecule to the next, next to the next, next to the next. So it's just vibration. That is a basic and core definitive conduction process. However, if we start to heat up metals, because metals have free electrons or delocalized electrons, additional to that vibration process, free electrons are also gonna have crisscross flow. And so we, you are going to have two type of uh, 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 heat transfer process within a metal. The vibration is going to happen through the core of the metal, the positive ions core, the, the way metallic bond works. And on the surface, the free electrons, the delocalized electrons which exist on the surface, they're going to have cross flow from hot to cold region and cold to hot region to transfer the heat energy as well. Because of these free electrons existence, metals are good conductor of electricity. You know, a good conductor of heat energy because of this free electrons, because convection is always a much more faster process than conduction. The vibration is actually not very fast. That's why non-conducting materials, I mean, or, or, or insulator materials, which do not have free electrons are very poor conductors. You can actually place one of the one end at a very hot flame and you can hold the other end for a very long time. You're not uh, gonna feel a thing. Yes. Yes. Also, not that I guess. So, yeah, uh, Asif actually asked me a question. Said, uh, can we say that conduction is a, a, a as convection in terms of electron? Well, here's the deal we should not define conduction as convection. I mean, the way the way the examiners actually or the CA people and also the fees people like to describe this is this way, Asif, hear me out, and everyone else as well, is that conduction primarily means the process of heat transfer by means of vibration of particles from one particle to the neighboring particles. That's the basic core definition of conduction. However, in metals, the free electrons also produce a complex convection process for which they can transfer the heat energy from hot end to the cold end much too faster. So the electrons make a convection process, but the metals core itself the solid part of the metal which is not the free electrons that does the convection conduction as well so conduction is different in terms of vibration exclusively whereas the electrons produce a complex convection process so we are not going to say that the metals are the metals can do convection and conduction both in general no exclusively the electrons which are capable to movement capable of movement they can produce a complex convection process asif does it make sense yes sir Bujha gets properly Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So in metals, we which have no free electrons, heat energy is conducted entirely by 
phonons that's a phonons is basically means the vibration uh, it's a very pretty uh, pretty uh, rare word you, you, you don't prefer to use this word anywhere but if you google this word you're gonna find out the meaning of this thing then we have a bit of a dis differentiation between good and bad conductors of heat and there are some examples for poor and bad conductors so this is actually uh, an example of poor and bad conductors this is a refrigerator where the sides are opened it's a pretty uh, blurred picture uh, so is it a, a layer of thermostatic material reduces the house oh, sorry, sorry, this was the oven this is the oven so the door of the oven and also the sides of the ovens they are all insulated by pretty thick material uh, and also this is actually uh, keeping the heat out refrigeration hold a cargo vessel during the construction so this is a cargo vessel where the inside is uh, lagged lagged in this means that we have installed some uh, insulating materials on the inside wall so that heat cannot be entering from the outside so what, what whether you want to keep heat in or whether you want to keep heat out irrespective if you want to uh, stop the heat transfer process, you have to provide some sort of insulation process. And that is what is what we call lagging. Lagging actually help to, uh, lagging can help to, uh, I mean, a good insulation process, a good ins insul insulation, insulation, uh, insulation will be able to reduce the conduction, convection and radiation, all three of them. If you're, if an insulation can only suppress two of them and does not suppress the third, then it's not a good insulation. If you want to stop or we can actually never stop heat transfer process from cold to hot object. You can only minimize it because whenever there's a temperature difference, heat will always find a way to travel from hot and air for hot location to cold location. There is no way you can entirely stop it. But by using lagging or by using insulation, we can minimize or slow down the process. That's the whole point of lagging or insulation processes. So that's the definition of the lagging. And then do we have the idea of ignition point of a gas? Uh, so ignition point of a gas actually is a pretty important idea. Let me describe this. Tumra agenista monoha chemistry already porso. Excitation energy name at the genisha. So my agenista chemistry the porso excitation energy name. No, sir. Agenista monoke boli. Monocoro, I mean, I must stove ta, it a chama monocor cooking stove, cooking stove, a cano chama chabi, a cooking stove. Let me just move myself. Let's say this is my cooking stove, and this is the key of the cooking stove. These are the legs of the cooking stove, and this is the, and so let's say I have turned on the cooking stove on. So methane gas is coming out. I can hear the hissing, but I don't see any flame. I have CH4, I have oxygen, but there is no flame. Why? Why doesn't this gas? Spontaneously catch fire. Do you know anyone? Does, does any of you know this thing? It's okay if you don't know. I'll tell you. I want to tell you. That's why I'm asking you this question. The question I both very If we just turn on the uh, turn on turn the uh, stove on without actually putting a flame over here, and we can hear the hissing of the gas, that means that methane gas is coming out of our, my stove, and there is also oxygen in the atmosphere. But as long as I don't put a flame within this out outcoming gas, I can never see a, actually, I do not, I will not see this mixture of methane gas and oxygen spontaneously, spontaneously mean by its own virtue or automatically on its own catch a fire. I wouldn't see this. Can any, do any of you know why? Methane gas is a colorless gas. So because it's colorless gas, it will not catch fire. Well, nitrogen is also a colorless gas, but will nitrogen ever catch fire? Uh, sir, sorry, no, sir. I'll tell you, I'll tell you. The idea is that, have a look, CH4 plus O2 converting into CO2 plus H2O. Eto hoche chemical reaction. To make this reaction happen, you have to first break the bonds between the CH. Taina, you have to break these four bonds and oxygen has some double bond over here. You have to break all of these six bonds, which should get give you oxygen bonds plus hydrogen bonds. So you're, you're gonna produce these six bonds. So you have to break these six bonds and you have to, you're gonna produce these six bonds. To break these six bonds, you need to first feed some energy. These molecules have some stability of their own. They are not futile uh, uh, molecules. I mean, they are bonded by covalent bonds. So they have some significant energy requirement. So if you just turn it on, just by the regular temperature of the room, these molecules are not gonna start to break up. However, if we start a spark over here, if you give it a bit of a spark, or if you bring up a gas lighter over here, which is lit, the location 
where that spark is made. Let's say I'm going to show a spark by a small bit of red. Let's say I put a spark over here at this point by a, uh, by a, a, spark, a spark lighter. The CH4 methane molecules, which are adjacent to the spark, they are going to energize immediately and oxygens are going to get energized immediately. They are going to break down and that, that, and then that broken down CH4 molecules and the oxygen molecules are going to recombine to produce this thing. And this will immediately produce a significant amount of heat. This heat energy that is produced from the very first reaction is going to produce a cascading effect, domino effect. This will ignite the neighboring CH4, neighboring CH4, neighboring CH4, and the entire thing will be engulfed in flame and then the flame will keep on burning. Do you understand this part? That first you have to somehow introduce a bit of an energy to start the process. Once it starts to produce its own flame, well, once it is, uh, once the gas stove is producing its flame, then all the methane which are coming in, they are readily entering into a hot environment. So they are already having enough energy for these bonds to be broken. So their bonds are breaking and this process is keep on happening continuously. So you don't have to light it up every once in a while. But if you don't introduce the first spark, then you cannot have it burned because the, then none of the methane molecules will have enough energy to have that breakdown to produce the first reaction. This is the important part. So the amount of energy that you require to actually make this decomposed is what we call activation energy in chemistry. And the temperature at which a certain flame, certain, certain flammable uh, liquid, for example, methane is a gas, or uh, propane, uh, octane, all of diesel, uh, diesel, petrol, you name it. Uh, we can have uh, wax is also a certain flammable material. So uh, the temperature at which a certain flammable material spontaneously catches fire, that is the temperature that we call what? Ignition point. And a good, good example that I can tell you. All, well, we all have now IPSs in our houses, so we don't see much of candles. But let me show you a very simple example. If you have a candle, let's say, uh, I'm going to draw a pretty artistic candle. So this is the candle side. So my bad. Let's say this is a candle and some melted wax. And this is the wick and this is a flame. Okay. Beautiful candle. So let's say this is a candle. Let's say this is the end point of the flame. If you hold up a paper, normal, regular paper, not tissue paper, regular paper, if you, not cardboard, regular paper. If you put up, a, if you place a paper somewhere above this flame right, right over here and keep it placed in, in this place, you'll see that pretty soon this part is going to slowly start to become black. Slowly start to become black. It, and at this point, if you start to bring it slightly closer to the flame, sometimes you don't have to place it to bring it closer. If, but if you start to bring it closer, at, will, at one point you'll see that without even touching the flame and the paper, this paper will automatically catch fire. You'll see this. The reason it happens is that paper has cellulose in it, which is a carbon hydrogen oxygen based compound. It is a flammable material, but the room temperature does not excite these particles enough so that, that will, they will automatically catch fire to react with oxygen. It doesn't work that way. But the moment you're placing it on top of a flame, heat energy, conduction, uh, convection heat energy and radiation heat energy is gonna reach out to this paper. And because paper is a poor conductor of heat, that, that heat energy absorbed is gonna be concentrated within this part and it will be keep storing that heat energy and at one point, the temperature of this paper is going to reach up to a certain temperature at which it can spontaneously catch fire, which means that at that point, the molecular bond, the atomic bond between the, uh, between the atoms of the molecule, they have become detached and they have become free and they are ready to now uh, react with the oxygen molecule. This temperature at which any object spontaneously catch fire is what we call ignition point. Does the definition make sense? Sorry, uh, you might have heard some noises. One of our people left, who left? Should I unlock the meeting? Okay, I just unlocked the meeting. I hope that person comes back. Pull one, Eddie Butsuki will see. Ignition point, I did a Yes. Yes, sir. The temperature at which any flammable object spontaneously catches fire. That is the, what you call the ignition point. Now let's have a look over here. Uh, hello. Uh, Uh, 
A flammable gas will burn if its temperature is a value known as the ignition point. The effect of a good conductor in the neighborhood of a flame can be shown by placing a wire gauge about 5 cm above a Bunsen burner. If the gas is turned on and lighted, lighted underneath the gauge, it is found that the flame does not pass through the gauge. The wires of the gauge conduct the heat of the flame away, so the rapidly the hot gases passing through the gauge are cooled below the ignition temperature. This gas is now turned out after the gauge is cooled. The gas is again turned on and is lit above the gauge. This time the flame continues to burn above the gauge. As in the previous case, the wires conduct heat rapidly away, with the result that the <coughs> temperature of the gas in contact with the underneath surface of the gauge is not raised to its ignition point. The flame will pass through the gauge only if it should become red hot. As well as you know, this is illustrated the principle of the Davy safety lamp. So let me show you this thing. First, I mean, this is a simple structure. And then I'm going to explain why this is important. Let's say we have a Bunsen burner over here. And above the Bunsen burner flame, we are placing a metal gauge. Gauge means a mesh of, of metal wires. We're placing it over here. This is uh, making uh, flame. This is making flame. So this is going to make the uh, gauge warm. And because metal is a good conductor of heat, what's going to happen, this metal gauge is going to absorb that heat uh, pretty strongly. And it's going to dissipate that heat pretty, pretty rapidly. So what's going to happen, as the gas molecules, they're going to rise above through the holes of the metal gauge, they're going to become cooled enough. You can control the thickness of the, uh, you can control the property of this metal mesh, part of the metal mesh means that how closely they are woven or what is the material of the metal mesh? Is it made from iron? Is it made from copper? Is it made from silver? Is it made from bronze? Is it made from some uh, other element in terms of good conductivity or poor conductivity? Then how, what is the thickness of the wire for the metal mesh? Is it made over, woven by thick wires or thin wires? So you can control the properties of the metal mesh and also the uh, burning intensity or the strength of the flame. You can match these two things in such a way that you can achieve a sweet spot something in, in, in such a way that you can achieve this scenario that the flame is going to be seen to only burn underneath the metal gauge and above the metal gauge this thing will not uh, there, there will be not, there won't be any flame the idea is that the metal gauge now working as a heat absorber and because metals are good 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 conductor of heat they're going to receive the heat from the flame and distribute it over all the corners of the of the metal gauge and the metal gauge is going to now then then lose its heat using that using the holes by means of convection of uh, uh, atmospheric particles and also definitely radiation will happen which is a warm object as we have discussed earlier and the metal gauge is going to cool off all the gas molecules which are going to pass through the holes as a result all the gas molecules whether they are burnt or unburnt doesn't matter as the gas molecules are passing through this metal gauge they're going to be cooled below the ignition point which means no flame would be seen above this metal gauge the metal gauge is cooling down the mixture of, uh, uh, of flame of, of the, of the uh, flammable gas and the oxygen mixture. It is cooling it down to below its ignition point. That's why above the metal gauge, there is no flame seen. logic of Bujhaya Gasegina. Bolaban? Is it possible to logically achieve? Hello. You now will respond, Goro. This is one one part. The second part over here is showing us a secondary scenario of this thing. This secondary scenario works in a different way. These two are not the same thing. This is one part of the experiment. The second experiment is that over here we heated this metal gauge by a very hot flame, and we heated this uh, metal gauge at its center to red hot. <laughs> Red hot means the center of the metal gauge was warmed uh, or heated. It was not warm. It was heated to a very high temperature by an external flame or maybe by this flame. Then we shut off the fluid flow. We shut off the uh, flammable gas. So the flame no longer exists anywhere within uh, above or below. And then we turn on the flame once again. We turn on the gas once again. So what's going to happen? So this is what is happening for the safety uh, Davy safety lamp. Davy safety lamp is not included in your syllabus, but there is a reason I'm telling you this because the mechanism that is involved over here is used for multiple questions. So you might not have to uh, have to come across the word Davy safety. What is Davy safety lamp? But the working principle of Davy safety lamp can be used to make questions about heat transfer process. So let me explain what is happening for the second picture. 
We have the film. We have the Bunsen burner uh, opening over here. This is a metal gauge. Um, uh, what are we gonna do? We're gonna first turn out it at a very high flame, like a super high flame. Such a such such a strong flame that it will be still burning through the flame and above, which means the metal gauge would not be able to make it uh, cool enough. As a result, this, this part that is over the flame, this is gonna become red hot. Because it's gonna become red hot, it's gonna have enough temperature for the ignition point of the flame. Then we're going to cut off the flame. So we're gonna off the fluid supply altogether, uh, gas supply altogether. So what, is gonna, what, what we're gonna have remaining is we're gonna have the metal mesh and at the center, there's a small bit of space, which is red hot. And now we have the Bunsen burner over here. So we're gonna switch it off and we're gonna have this. Now we're gonna turn it on once again. So in between we offed it. When we will turn it on, only gas are gonna come up through here. This is just unburned gas. This is just flowing in pretty much like you turn on the stove but didn't put the flame in. The moment this gas is gonna get in contact with this red hot metal, metal mesh, then they're gonna catch a fire. As a result, the flame would be seen above this metal mesh. And this flame will automatically keep this temperature of this metal mesh hot enough so that it will be always above the ignition point. So you're gonna feed the flame from here, but the you're gonna feed the gas from here, but the flame will be produced at a significant gap. Do you understand what is happening? Bolavan. Am I muted? Yes. I don't think I'm muted. So this is what is happening. Now, wh why is it a safety? How does it help us safety? What happened when, when people actually started the mining processes? Well, a lot of mine actually have a lot of trap, uh, trap gas pockets, which is uh, in many cases, flammable gases, uh, methane gas, propane gas, those kind of gases. And people can have die. A lot of people have died from explosions, mine explosions. And mine explosions can be very ugly. I mean, people die from explosion. People die from fire hazard. People get uh, squashed by stones and rocks. I mean, it's a mess. It's a very bad kind of mess. So um, uh, uh, Humphrey Davy, uh, he developed this technology. And what he did is that he put, uh, other than having an open flame, he developed this thing and wrapped it around with a bit of a glass. Wrapped it around with a bit of a glass. So what happened that the flame, so if you are, if you, even if this, this, this lamp is brought into a, brought into a, a environment that is filled up with natural gas, which is, which would have caught fire if, if it was exposed to an open flame like this, what's gonna happen? Well, this is a flame, which means essentially we have hot current over here, which obviously means that to compensate this draft, draft means small airflow, we have to allow cold air flow from here. So what's gonna happen, we're gonna see cold air flow in through here and the explosion will only happen within this lamp. And that explosion will simply turn off this flame. Not even the glass lamp will even explode. So anytime, any place you go in, let's say a person uh, who is, in a, who is, uh, who is uh, doing some mining is entering into a new part of the, of the cave and suddenly their DV lamp shut off with a large blip that makes sense that in within this space we have some trapped gas which we should not get close to or what they would do in that case they would get away from this place and burn out some dynamite over here so that the gas would essentially make its burning and 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 explosion on its own without any human beings around and then once it is all burned out people would once again re-enter and do their mining process so this, but if it was exposed to an open flame the whole, the entirety of this uh, flammable gas would actually make a huge explosion do you understand what has happening here? Could you explain the dynamite thing again? Oh, uh, let's say this is the cave. Okay, so people are coming in. These are the people coming in. Okay, they have that devil lamp within themselves. Now they walked in here and they found that the, their lamp went off with a large, large bloop. So they're gonna move out. They're gonna move out, they're gonna get away. And let's say they're gonna leave a bit of a uh, string uh, cotton trail. And they're gonna light up the cotton trail over here. People are pretty far away, far away from the explosion hazard. This cotton cotton wick is gonna burn, 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 and it's gonna eventually enter into the thing. Now they have a, now the gas that is tapped over here is gonna get the flame, but there is no people. So this is gonna make its own explosion without any people around, right? Yes. And once the explosion happens, all the flammable gases are already burned, so you don't have any hazard anymore. Now the people are gonna re-enter and do their mining job as as usual. So you are essentially 
detecting where that kind of gas is there using the say Davy lamp, and then you are you can burn it out without the presence of any human being around, and that basically gives a huge safety factor. Make sense? Yes, sir. Thank you. No problem. So there we have some design for the Humphrey safety day, day safety day lamp, and you can read about this thing. And now we have all the uh, all the uh, examples of uh, of different type of uh, uh, processes that conduction resistors and then the, this thing. Uh, this is the example that I started our uh, our lecture with. That if we have a combined thing over here, what is gonna see? So what you're gonna see over here that if we apply some bit of heat energy right over here at the joint, uh, which is closed with a paper collar. Paper collar means just a wrapped around paper. We're gonna see that the metal part is not changing color, but the wooden part is starting to change color for uh, earlier. The reason is that the metal being a good conductor of heat is gonna take away heat from the paper and it's gonna heat it up itself. Whereas the wood being a poor conductor of heat cannot take that much heat from the paper. Is the surface of the wood molecules are gonna become heated up, but the neighboring particles are not gonna become that much heated up because wood is a poor conductor of heat. So all the heat that this part of the paper that, that was coated on the top of the wooden cylinder that is going to pretty much remain within the paper and soon that paper will reach its ignition point and it's going to start to become charred. So that's the experiment. Then we have a bit of an experiment over here. I want you to read about this thing. There's a bit of an experiment over here. And then we have some examples for convection currents and pretty beautiful uh, diagrams over here. And then, then we have a process for how does the domestic hot water supply system works. This is a good uh, uh, diagram. And then we have the land bridges and crude coal sea bridges. Then we have the radiation getting started. Radiation is described a little bit. Then we have the idea of the radiation, radiation thermopile. You don't have to read about thermopile. You can forget about thermo thermopile. But thermoelectric effect is something that we have seen earlier. So this is also possible. Uh, here, the hot junction is basically made by the touch of the finger. And the cold junction is the galvanometer. So we can see some reading over here. You don't have to read the thermopile. You can skip this all together. Then we can uh, okay, then we'll have to jump over here to compare the radiation from different surfaces. So you have to read this part. These, these, these are very important. Especially, I'm going to help you to understand the structure of a thermo flask. How does it work? <laughs> and this experimental drawing that you see over here is really, really important for uh, some question that comes in your paper two and also in paper four. I'm not sure if you're gonna, if, if you are accused are gonna be entitled to appear for paper three in your all of us exam. I don't say, I don't know how the COVID situation is gonna turn out when you will be ready for your exam within one year time that is. But if you are appearing for paper four, you have to be able to understand this figure and draw this figure as well. For paper two as well, you have to understand this figure as well. And then we it goes on further, further, and then we have some questions over here. Okay, so kids, listen up. This is what I'm gonna do. You have the PDF and your current job is to read this entire PDF piece by piece. Okay, how many of you access these classes exclusively by a cell phone device? Do all of you have computers? Uh, some of you don't have computers. Hello? Sir, I interview a laptop. Okay, hear me out. If you kids are using a laptop, <clears throat> then preferably have one of the old i mean slightly old uh, uh version of a for full version or cracked version of a pdf uh, pdf uh, uh, reader foxy reader can prove to be pretty useful because you can actually edit pdfs i mean you can mark on the pdf using that and also sir i'm the foxy reader as the foxy reader they would have easily mark jai mark kora jai i mean you put a drag and if then you can save those things as well আর হচ্ছে যারা মোবাইল থেকে ইউজ করতেছো মোবাইল থেকে ইউজ করলো তোমার অ্যাডোবিটিটা দিয়ে ওটা করতে পারবা যে একটু মার্ক করা এই জিনিসগুলো আমি এটা মার্ক করার কথা কেন বলতেছি ইউর কারেন্ট জব ইস টু রিড দিস এন্টার পিডিএফ ফ্রম দ্য ভেরি ফার্স্ট ওয়ার্ড টু দ্য ভেরি লাস্ট ওয়ার্ড এক্সেপ্ট ফর দ্য থার্মোমাইল থার্মোপাইল সেকশন অ্যান্ড অলসো টু ট্রাই অ্যান্ড এনিথিং দ্যাট ইউ ডাজেন দ্যাট ডাজেন্ট মেক সেন্স দ্যাট ইউ ওয়ান্ট মি টু ডিসকাস জাস্ট পুট এ স্মল কোয়েশ্চন মার্ক অন দ্য লেফট অফ দিস থিং and you can underline those parts underlining actually can take a lot of effort because there are pretty thin lines just put a question mark over here so that you would know that i want to ask question from this somewhere over here which you will say hello yes, sir so eta to korba fear go bujhar chesta karo and then if you are done reading this whole thing i would like you to read this exercise question and get some idea you don't have to fill fill up in, in writing just read these questions and try to get some idea that if i was answering this question for uh some marks how would i what should i write or can i actually write anything about these questions so that is your current class work which you have to uh, you have about 21 minutes to finish this thing so i'm uh, so i want you kids to get into this thing i'm not going to uh, do a, do any discussion about this but this is your class work so i'm going to stop the class and hoche next class ami tomader ke eta ni further alap korbo ar tomader booklet tomader hate poshanor byabostha korteche inshallah 
बुझा गया से की वो सी कुलवान जी सर डोंट लीव फ्रॉम योर स्टेशंस डोंट लीव फ्रॉम योर डिवाइसेस योर करंट क्लास वर्क इज टू रीड दिस थिंग ऑल टुगेदर थैंक यू वेरी मच आई लव इट सामी किसी बोलते सो सुना अच्छा ना सामी सामी लिखो आमी तुम्हारे कथा सुनते सीना बाबा 